Welcome to the third installment, no, fourth installment of OP Jindal Lectures. I'm Ashutosh Varshne, Director of the Brown India Initiative and Professor of Political Science. These uh, lectures were endowed in perpetuity by Brown parents Sajjan and Sangeeta Jindal in the memory of Sajjan's father, OP Jindal, an industrialist, a philanthropist, and also a politician from the northern Indian state of Haryana. <clears throat> the purpose of these lectures is to promote, here at Brown, a discussion of politics, economics, social, and cultural change in modern India. <clears throat> the first three Jindal lecturers were Kaushik Basu on India's economy, Ashley Tellis, on India's security, and Ram Guha on Mahatma Gandhi. The lecturer this week, today and Friday, is Ashish Nandi. The larger theme is partition violence of these two lectures. Today's lecture is entitled, Forgetting the Unforgettable, Memories of a Killing. Introducing Ashish is both easy and hard. It is easy because I've known him for over two decades and I've had the pleasure of his friendship. It is also hard because he defies easy professional categorization. He was trained as a clinical psychologist, but he also has intimate familiarity with social, political, and anthropological theories. And at one stage in his life, he even taught statistics. Um, he ranges widely, as you can imagine, picks big themes for inquiry, lets his intellectual curiosity lead him to wherever he should go in search of explanations, and this pursuit of restless curiosity leads him, restless creativity in the end produces insights, arguments, images, and narratives that last and shape the inquiry of others for years to come. It is best to call, in my view, such a mind a pioneering mind. Among the many intellectual contributions Ashish has made, I'd like to list two in particular today. I may speak about some other contributions on Friday. Um, and the first one that I would like to call your attention to is his very influential book, The Intimate Enemy, Loss and Recovery of Self Under Colonialism, first published in 1983 and still widely read all over the world. It's been in print for over three decades. The Intimate Enemy started with the claim that the political economy of colonialism, while not insignificant, was not as interesting or not as researched as the psychology that colonialism sought to create, not only for the colonized, but also for the colonial masters. The focus in the end was on Mahatma Gandhi and how he sought to answer a deeply significant question, namely, how should one reclaim self-respect in conditions of colonial subjugation? what cultural resources were available and could be deployed in that pursuit. <clears throat> A second big Nandi idea, something that intellectually shook me when I was working on Hindus and Muslims, was his critique of secularism. To put it briefly, mercilessly briefly, uh, we don't have as much time today as on Friday, Ashish basically argued that secularism, despite its commitment to religious peace, can actually lead to a lot of religious violence. Recovery of pre-modern religious traditions, if possible, would in all likelihood be more aligned with peace than a pursuit of secularism. A whole new line of inquiry was thereby inaugurated. Today he speaks to us on a body of work that he has been engaged in for the last 10 years, perhaps a bit more. In the late 1990s, he came up with the idea <clears throat> that the generation 
that directly witnessed partition violence of 1947-48 would be around only for another 10 to 15 years. By interviewing them, this, new, this generation, by accessing their memories, much that is new can be learned. More than 1,500, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, more than 1,500 interviews were conducted with those who witnessed partition violence directly and some who even confessed to perpetrating it. Ashish will speak to us for 45 minutes. My colleague, Vazira Zamidar, will then comment for 10 to 15 minutes. Her own book some years ago, The Long Partition and the Making of Modern South Asia, also dealt with partition violence and examined not only the archives, but also collected narratives of those who had witnessed violence. Please welcome Ashish Nandi. Ashish, you want me to come there or should I pick from here? It's up to you. This may be, no? Uh, huh? Up to you. If that is all right, I will speak from here. Okay. Uh, I'm a Bengali, I feel always more comfortable Sitting. Sitting. I think better. Uh, because these are going to be two lectures, I will try to avoid repeating myself. <clears throat> so, though it is not very fair on those whom I come to the second lecture and not, will, are not here today, I shall very briefly say something very general about the nature of partition and violence first, very quickly, in the <coughs> next 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And I shall try to speak in telegraphies to save time. Uh, if I have time, I will elaborate on some of the themes a little more later on. I shall try, but I don't promise that. <clears throat> First, a personal note. I started my life as a student of medicine, medicine, then changed to sociology and then to psychology while working in a psychoanalytic clinic, which also reaffirmed what you might call the clinical gaze. And when I study violence, it is that gaze which often comes back to me as a part of the repertoire. <clears throat> but unfortunately, I have found that that is not liked by very many. A clinical gaze cannot make an empirical study of a case of a person you are studying or investigating dependent on, uh, uh, dependent on the law of probability. I didn't phrase it right, let me put it again. Try again. A clinical gaze does not allow you to say that this particular patient has only 5% chance of survival. So it will be better for the society and the family and the medical system to save our efforts for more deserving cases which are likely to survive. <clears throat> you are supposed to look at the case on its own and even if the chance is less than 5%, you are supposed to struggle and to do that you have to identify what are the resources and strengths there is in the person you are studying. And my effort 
throughout my work on violence, on which I have worked for the last 45 years, has been to try to locate the strength and resources available to a society or a culture or a person to confront <clears throat> the violence. That's mine. Uh, unfortunately, I have found that in social sciences, that gaze is called romantic, a romantic and retrogressive vision because invariably it also means that you look into the sources of in culture and community and this does not give you a very as grim a picture of a genocide as many would like to have. When we started this work, it was the 50th anniversary of India's independence. And a drove of journalists from all over the world came to Delhi. And many of them landed at our center, at my office, because they had heard that I'm doing this study. And invariably, they asked for some idea of, of what kind of things we were finding. So I would say to them, all right, tell me what kind of thing you are looking for, because it is a largish team with something like 30 persons involved, so I can choose the right person to whom you could go. The answer in most of the cases can be put in four or five words. They said, tell us the goriest stories. So I am not going to tell you the goriest stories. I will start from the other end. What are the redeeming features? <clears throat> what are the features which you do not expect when you are studying a genocide? And for that, there are very few precedents. I'm, I must say I have found. Only now, recently, some people are concentrating on rescuers. Rescuers. But when we started, there was one or two, three persons who had studied this problem. So that's one. The second part of personal history I want to mention here is this, that I was nine when partition violence began. And when I studied partition violence, I was 60. Arab so or so. I found soon that there was a new in interest in that violence. And I had to first face this problem that why was I the oldest person studying partition violence? And why has not my, my cohorts have not studied it earlier? That part of the story I will not say, but this was something I had to look into. And the silence about partition is a very important part of the work I have done. And this silence I have found now is not unique to this genocide. One could even stick one's neck out and say that it takes at least one and a half generations for some of the more lasting works on genocide to come out. The early works 
of people like Eric Fromm and Bruno Bettelheim, people have more or less forgotten. Though they were interesting in themselves. But if you compare the work of some of the later workers with that, you will find the later works with some distance from it, much more interesting. And indeed, I found out that the more interesting works on the partition violence in South Asia was been done by people who had never seen the violence. They were too young to have seen it. <clears throat> in fact, these two women started it, Urvashi, Butalia, and the two men, and the ones who first did it, and Saida, Saida Khan, Lahore. They are the first ones to start this. And um, it, it is a fact that there is this. I mean, just to give you one example, the famous pioneering psychoanalyst in India who started the psychoanalytic movement in India, a personal friend of Freud who got his, got analyzed by Freud himself in, through letters of all things. Uh, uh, G.S. Bose stayed in Calcutta in a house which was surrounded by slums which were some of the first to break into writing. He must have been able to see from his home because I our home was also quite close to that. From, must have been able to see from his home houses burning. Must have seen at least some strange instances of violent di violence directly. He himself was interested in the problem of violence, took special interest in Gandhi's nonviolence <clears throat> as a solution to violence, but did not write a word on the subject. He was a prolific writer too, but did not write a word on the subject. That is something also we have to confront <clears throat> and deal with. And the third personal thing I would like to mention is this, that the more interesting theoretical issues arose after we had gone to the field with a schedule or a questionnaire and after we had started interviewing people. So the study in some sense was rendered somewhat backdated by our findings themselves. So there is kind of built-in contradiction here. Uh, anyway, I don't want to spend more time on that. But I, in addition to this personal reasons, I will like to very briefly now mention a few of the salient findings of the overall study, which might be of some interest and sets the context of the two cases I will discuss. The idea of partition as a source of violence was not there for the simple reason that this kind of partitioning was not there in history. All the four instances of partition in the 20th century were done by one party. It was colonial Britain. The four partitions which they imposed on them and a solution of possible violence themselves led to violence and continued, I mean, led to continuous bloodletting for decades. <clears throat> All the four partitions Ireland, Cyprus, Palestine, and India all the four. There were other cases where they have done, map making was their professional, uh, professional interest, I can put it that way. If you look at the maps of Africa and West Asia, you will find many straight lines. 
and I don't have to tell you that uh, the, the, very, the map itself tells you the story to some extent, that this kind of straight lines, you know, I mean, and, uh, uh, yeah, and if, if you uh, look at the maps, you know that it takes some degree of arrogance and self-confidence to em em embark on a human engineering at, at that scale, where you decide the fate of communities and the border is borders of countries and societies overnight through an intellectual and political exercise. Uh, that kind of self-confidence probably earlier imperial powers did not have. It is only in the 19th century that human beings acquired that self-confidence and impose that, to impose that kind of a solution of peoples they have ruled over. <clears throat> so that is one. So the South Asian partition is one partition yeah, of the four. And I will also suggest to you that this partitioning, this pastime of partitioning, or finding partisan a solution to human problems, can only have come from a worldview and an atti attitude to human engineering, if I may call it so, which is post-enlightenment, which comes from a hard material positivist assumptions, and which presumes that some communities, some cultures of governance know better than the governed what to do with the life of the governed. All the bloodletting letting stopped. All these four cases, the bloodletting has stopped. One can say only when the contesting sides got tired of bloodletting. At least in one case, it has still not stopped. But <laughs> because the two sides are still not that tired, I presume. <clears throat> And gradually, when I study the two theaters of war in South Asia, Punjab and Bengal, where most of the killings took place, I became aware of something that made me look beyond South Asia to find out. And not only in the other case of partition, but also in some of the major, very well-studied situations of violence genocide, if you like, <clears throat> that perhaps the goriest accounts of violence come not from places where the two communities involved in the violence are strangers, but are very closely intertwined, culturally and psychologically. And for some reason, there is a rupture, and that relationship has become now a poison, poison gift. And this disturbed me to no end, because I had a this thing where the relationship, the, he talks of associations between communities and how they protect you against violence. But I am not talking actually of political, economic, and social relationships only. I am talking of the psychological situation where two communities are so close that they cannot define themselves without the other community. Where your self-definition is incomplete without the other. And that, where that intertwining or introjection of each other 
in some sense, has come to a state where he was seeking some kind of an exorcism. Exorcism. <clears throat> in fact, after, while doing this study, I began to relook at some of the better studied instances of violence, like the European Holocaust. And I, by the way, the term used in India for genocide is the same as Holocaust. So forgive if I use it for both. I mean, because is it many Israeli scholars do not like the fact that you are using Holocaust, but we cannot help it. I mean, this is what the actual uh, in, uh, respondents also say in India, the pralaya. It was like a pralaya. <coughs> So this, I think, is a crucial clue why the violence in Punjab, for instance, in the South Asian case, took that horrendous form. It became a kind of an exorcism because the other side is present both as a temptation and a, pos and a possibility. And you try to cleanse yourself of that temptation and that possibility. And this was probably the case in Germany too, to some extent. Because German Jews were supposed to be the most integrated Jewish community in Europe. But I will let it pass at the moment. That's not what I'm trying to say. But this also means that we have to confront the fact that genocides in a community-based society and genocides in a mass culture, this massified society, primarily individuality based, takes a very different form. One or two scraps of data, if I mention, it will become clear to you. In our study, roughly 40% of the respondents said that they have been, they were directly helped by somebody from the opposition during the violence or had known and knew, or knew of somebody being helped by the opposition. This is a very different kind of story. I don't think in other general sites the figures come anywhere near this, 40%. 40% said what? That? that they have been directly helped. Directly if they're helped. Hindus, they were helped by Muslims. If they were Muslim, they were helped by Hindus. Um, or knew others directly that they have been helped like this. This is a fantastic data. It's a different kind of mass violence where this level of help people have given. You know. <clears throat> So there is ground level resistance. The only clue I can get, or at that time I could get, now I have some more, a few more, but the one I got at the time I will mention, that in Fogelman's study of rescuers, she studied uh, rescuers in, in the context of Germany, she found that the people who, Germans who helped Jews, had two or three features. One, they were wanted children in the families and embedded in a community and deeply religious. I need hardly tell you that in South Asia, these features will be more <laughs> easily obtainable <laughs> than in a mass individuated mass society. That, that may be one of the clues that we have. One feature, other feature, is this our study, and this is not only in our study. In virtually every study of partition, this theme records that the pre-partition days emerges as a, almost as a lost utopia. You find this in Deepesh Chakrabarti, 
in his collection, you find in our studies a huge majority, almost without exception, I mean, the, the, that the, the pre-partition days are invoked as, as virtually a lost utopia, as something which is like a paradise lost, and often from very hard-boiled cleaner, killers and very hard-boiled uh, fanatics who claim to be fanatics. I mean, I will give an example, a telling example. Uh, there is this person, B. L. Sharma Payne. I wish I had that thing so I could read it out because he has very interesting ways of putting it, very abusive way of putting it. Who, when Suketu Mehta interviewed him, he was very vituperative about Muslims. He gave it, there was a long tirade against all Muslims, how bad they are, and how beef-eating was the bane of Muslims, and because they, beef is actually an aphrodisiac, so they, if we eat beef, if, if you, held, you become, uh, you, you turn more aggressive, and uh, of course you are turn a rapist, uh, and so on and so forth. He went on at this vein, uh, and how, how Hindu, women only produce rats, and that is why we have lost Lahore and, and uh, Karachi and so on and so forth. So we went on at this theme. But Suketu Mehta was one person, this is the man who wrote the uh, book on Bombay. Maximum uh, City. Uh, Max, <coughs> maximum City. Uh, he stuck on. He didn't give up on him, and after hearing the tirade, so stuck on. So after he has said all this, which he probably says in all situations, um, he, one, one, you know, he stuck a relationship with this man and hung around and tried to get his life story. And gradually it transpired after three, four days that Mr. B. L. Sharma Payne, who is also a functionary of uh, the BJP, um, and, um, and uh, uh, also I think associations with the RSS, uh, began to tell him other things which did not go with this story very much. For example, it transpired that he had had in his childhood a Muslim wet nurse. Until she lived, this great hater of Muslims used to send her monthly a, 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 a money stipend. stipend till she lived. It also came out uh, that he has secretly visited Pakistan twice to see his childhood friends, who also obviously had beef. <laughs> but secretly because his present political identity uh, and politi you know, e image would have been uh, drastically uh, altered if people came to know that he was visited Pakistani to meet his childhood friends. And this, I'm, I can tell you many, many of these such, such stories. Um, I uh, also in, interviewed Madan Lal Pawa, who's not only killed a lot of Muslims randomly, but also was in the conspiracy to kill Gandhi and was in jail for 18 years. He was the youngest member of the conspiracy team of conspirators. Uh, <coughs> 18, he was sentenced to life imprisonment and released after 18, and, it, and I interviewed him. And he was so abusive, not only of the Muslims, but also of Gandhi as a kind of a uh, person who treated the Hindus as, as his stepchildren and uh, was responsible for partition and so on and so forth. But as days passed, and he ran out of his invectives, he began to stalk a different tone. It transpired ultimately that he pined for the days when he was in Pak Patan, in Montgomery district of Pakistan, where there is a, and remembered with great nostalgia uh, the, uh, mama, this, uh, this mazar of Baba Farid and the festival that took place. And even in his old age, sang out tremulously some of the Kavalis, these Kavals who sing there, uh, 
which he remembered still and said those were the best days of my life and ultimately said that actually Muslims are not a bad people uh, uh, only some of them are scoundrels <laughs> so, so uh, and anyway so this is the way it goes so this is the other part of the story I want to say perhaps that also explains why there is this thing and it is perhaps because of this that a very large proportion of the respondents we had have never shared their experience with their own children and grandchildren. So it is not only the scholars who have observed the, uh, observed the principles of silence, but even, even the vic actual victims have maintained this, their silence over the years. The two cases I've chosen to do uh, here has a more specific intent. I wanted to remind you that of the one million which scholars now estimate to have died, I think the figure is those who estimate it to be something around two million are probably co more correct because we do see uh, from the records that a lot of people said that the elderly died they are not soon after coming to India. And there is people do not take into account the epidemics which broke out while the uh, refugees were fleeing from one country to the other. These are not uh, taken into account. The figure will be closer to two, to, uh, two million. <coughs> but the numbers, I think, is not that important. The important part of the story is this, that uh, none of the victims and none of the uh, you know, the, uh, persons who have gone through the experience in general ever got any help of any, or even sought the help of any psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, clinical psychologists, some psychiatric social workers. The uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was unknown illness at the time. And nobody neither sought this help nor were given this help. They have struggled with their own experiences themselves. And I must say that even if you uh, even today, uh, in any psychiatrist or clinical clinician would be uh, very presently surprised by the way many of them have struggled with that and met some meaning, 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 uh, uh, given some meaning to their experiences. Maybe sometimes through an exaggerated emphasis on religion, sometimes through psychosomatic ailments. They have tried to contain or bind their uh, mem memories into some manageable phase uh, or bind their anxieties. And sometimes uh, through certain kind of obsessive compulsive uh, features. These are there, but on the whole, they have handled themselves relatively well. Now, in the two stories that I've included here, I would very briefly time men mention them, uh, are the uh, represent two extreme forms, and this can be seen as two dimensions of the way it is managed. In one case, it is the story of a Jat Sikh who one day wakes up and finds that people are making years, that people are uh, organizing jathas, that's the term in Punjab they use for what you might call a band, band or a gang or a uh, say, uh, or it's, it's a kind of a band of people 
who get together either to attack or to protect themselves. And they, there was these stories that they were building jathas all over the place. And he then finds out that uh, these jathas in, in his area were led by a very famous um, leader of a jatha, and uh, um, they were invariably supported by of officials. He, he was in the Pakistan side of the border. Uh, they were supported by officials who were mostly in his account, mostly from people who have been displaced themselves, either as transferred officials on that side or as people who have lost something in, on the Indian side and come out to, to Pakistan. So they were the persons who were um, uh, this leading the jet. Uh, though in, uh, in his case, there was also, there was this person who talk, he talks of him almost as a well-known person, famous person who led the Jatta because he was a notorious person in the locality. He knew him also, some, some kind of a vague awareness of his existence. Now, therefore, this person, six also then decided to build, build a Jatta, and the story is that of a kind of a cat and mouse game between these two Jattas, and how they outmaneuver them, they kill each other, they lose some people on the side, but they ultimately manage to maneuver, uh, manipulate things and move towards uh, the river Ravi uh, in Punjab, which divides into India and Pakistan, which is constitutes the border, and move towards them and successfully ultimately cross the river by uh, forcing a young Muslim boy who was uh, had a boat and that uh, crossing itself took a huge amount of time, but they all managed to successfully go to the other side. <coughs> he is the only person, he is now a Sikh farmer in his mid-80s, on this side of the border, very in great peace with himself. He has no bitterness, no anger about the whole experience, and he is very clearly said that they attacked us, and therefore we, at least we also attacked them, and they killed us, and we also killed them. He is the only person we have found who does not show any sense of loss, is not at all uh, feels that uh, he, uh, he, 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 he has lost out something. He says we are much better off now than we were there. And he is also the only person who said that often the the Jattas which attacked the Sikhs and the Hindus not only had Muslims but also had some Hindu communities uh, as comes kind of subsidiaries. So Jattas were not re, uh, kind of a, uh, exclusively Muslim Jattas. Uh, they also included, uh, especially they included lower caste Hindus who had, you know, uh, because they were probably after loot. Uh, wanted to benefit from the uh, pillage. Uh, well, this is the story of that man. And I, the, from the description of this whole uh, encounter with this man, it is obvious that he is talking like, a, almost like a uh, retired uh, soldier uh, who has given a good fight to the opposition, but has no bitterness against the opposition. He, in fact, says, when this uh, interviewer asked him directly, you must be very bitter against the Muslims. He says, why should I be? I all trusted them more than I trusted my Hindu neighbors. Uh, uh, but at that time, they tried to attack us, so we had to attack them. So there's no bitterness, or, uh, absolutely no bitterness. He is a retired soldier who is happy with his lot, he is still, in mid-80s, he still takes care of farming. His family is with him, and they settle down on this side of the border. They, are, they feel that they have, had, no, they have not lost out anything. As opposed to that, on the other side, is another jat, this time not a Sikh, a jat, Hindu jat farmer, who Was a, you know, who who describes his past, and it transpires that he was a, uh, also 
in many ways he shows some of the characteristics of uh, the, which Fogelman describes as a feature of his, uh, uh, the rescuers. He had this, you know, very uh, much wanted child in a uh, parent who were for a long time childless and then he, he was born and his grandparents and parents take a lot of care of him and he is an excellent, uh, ex uh, well, um, very moving description of his childhood and this uh, with friends amongst Muslims and so on and so forth. And though gradually the atmosphere changes in the mid 40s and when the violence breaks out, the Muslims begin to move out of the village selling their land and they are uh, much unhappiness in the village because everybody is sorry that the um, uh, time has come to part. Um, the, they, were very, they took a lot of care to ensure that no Muslims in the village were killed because it would be very shameful, they said, if people in their own village are killed by outsiders, mobs, and so on and so forth. But then comes the uh, news that two trains have arrived from Pakistan uh, f uh, f uh, full of in, all, no, dead bodies and only the guards and the drivers were left alone so that the trains could bring the dead bodies to India and show what can be done to them. Pakistanis also wanted to teach lessons. And then this, these people go, two, three friends go and see those trains and that begins to change the whole atmosphere here on this side. Um, incidentally, if you look at other studies uh, on the, uh, in uh, Gan Pandey's work, you will find the Pakistani side also, their version of these trends also. So that's not a, uh, I'm sure you have found it there. <clears throat> so this changes the atmosphere and a, when a caravan of an entire village moving from India to Pakistan passes by the village. And there's a minor quarrel which takes a serious turn. And with the experience of having seen those train full of dead bodies, these people immediately took out their guns and began to fire at the caravan. And they were passing by the canal and it's a description of um, I will just read out uh, one or two things of this. So this is the, towards the end of his interview. Uh, this is the way the interviewer describes it. This time they sat in a living room. It was a big, ill-lit room. And apart from a few unembroidered pictures uh, hanging on the wall, one of them had, uh, anyway, I, let, this is also not that I can, Draw, uh, uh, did not read this out. Hot, hot tea was, uh, some sweets were served. Mangaltram avoided the sweets, saying he was a diabetic. There was a silence while the interviewer felt Mangaltram was studying her for some reason. He then started to speak. He says, all the people who went around killing had lots of self-respect. Weak people cannot do it. Those were such times that one had to take up arms. The young had to avenge the dishonor to their community. It was their dharma because they had seen the train loads of dead bodies. Those days it was very common to find a body rotting here and there, cattle roaming around without owners or children without parents. The months after Baishaki, that's the festival time, the spring festival celebrated in Punjab, there were many rumors floating around and much fear. 
the local police had been told that no Muslim was to be harmed. They were to be safely escorted to the special train scheduled to leave from Amritsar. But in early September, etc., there's two trains when they came. Now, he, then, then he describes. As it happened, some young members of the caravan picked up a fight with the villagers. It began as a minor clash, but soon became serious, and Mangatram and his associates took out their guns. It was monsoon, and those people were walking along a canal. As Mangatram and his friends fired, people kept on falling into the canal. They could not run away because on the lower land, there were men waiting with hatchets. Whoever tried to run away was hacked and thrown in the canal. Some jumped in the canal, mostly women. Some even jumped with their babies in their arms. Mangatram said that they were firing from his rooftop and they could see. Mangatram said that they were, huh, it was rainy season and the water of the canal was muddy and swirling. People and corpses would disappear within seconds. So many people died that day. The mud colored water in the canal turned reddish. Mangatram paused to breathe, breathe, breathe deeply and shook his legs for some time. Then he again took a few deep breaths as if testing his lungs. I do not know how I could do it that day. Till this day, when talking about it, I can see the entire scene clearly. No, I have not forgotten anything. These things happen once in a rare while. I have also not forgotten the train load of corpses. It was stinking so badly, and there were so many flies on the dead bodies. There was a loud humming noise made by the flies. Oh, the smell. We worked with volunteers and sweepers to clean up and perform the last rites. Though we are high caste people, not supposed to participate in such acts, but those were troubled times. Chaudhuri Mangatram remained silent for a while then held his turbaned head in his hands, weeping. He pressed his forehead with his knuckles. All Verma could see, the interviewer could see, was the heaving, starched turban. She was witness to the ultimate ignominy of a jat patriarch crying like a woman in front of a woman who was his grandson's friend. The interviewer was a woman and to whom he had once said that he found comical the sight of a grown-up person cry. Mangatram tried to recover. If today there were a riot, I do not think I shall take part in it. I am old now. Also, I do not think we shall ever see trains full of dead bodies again. I do not think that madness will affect people again. I was young those days. My blood used to boil. You do these things when your mind does not work. Your anger does. He claimed mechanically that he did not feel guilty, like the other ones I have talked about. They do not say they do not feel guilty. But their body tells another story. In fact, even their voice tells another story, that they do feel guilty. It is not easy for a citizen killer to be mobilized to kill and then return to his pre-partition uh, uh, pre self. You know, we have, once we have been mobilized, that experience remains with you. And I give this example, but I could have given you other examples. I could have given you the examples of people who still see the
the f you know, uh, still see visions we did not of people, somebody, you know, there was this one person who has killed somebody. And whenever she, he acted it out, that whenever he sat in the room, he said, felt that somebody in the room was there with head bowed. This, they are haunted by memories of those whom they have killed. Uh, if you have seen, any of you have seen the act of killing about this forgotten Indonesian um, uh, genocide. That's right, absolutely. Um, you, you, uh, you will see that even there, the killers are not in peace with themselves. It is not easy to kill without repercussions. Uh, there are built-in checks in human nature against killings too. Um, I was, if those who have, you who have read Dave Grossman's work on killings, will know that he uses the data of First World War, where it transpired after the war that 70% of the bullets fired by the soldiers during World War I was fired not at the oh, other, other side, but the, you know, fired. And it is the peer group which forces you, to some extent, conform to the rules, but it doesn't matter. It has not made things any easier, for the armies have um, learned how to bypass this resistance. Um, the machine killing, which you see now more often, uh, the, uh, and the industrialized killings which took place um, in some of the violences, uh, are instances where this process has been partly bypassed. But nonetheless, in an ordinary, normal, community-based society, Killings and memories of killing are not easy to live with. And perhaps even in the case of South Asian uh, violence, not only these memories of killing haunt those who have killed, but the fear of that experience informs every negotiation in the political sphere, every diplomatic move, and every attempt to establish a normal relationship with the two countries. I am reminded of A.Q. Khan, the father of the Pakistani bomb, whom Indian journalist Kuldeep Nayar interviewed. And A.Q. Khan admitted to Kuldeep Nayar, I'm just, this is, I'm finishing, admitted to Kuldeep Nayar that Pakistan has already built the bomb. So Kuldeep Nair asked him, Dr. Khan, your own family stays in central India, in Bhopal, and you have built this bomb in Pakistan, or, or, uh, for Pakistan. Don't you think if you use it against India, uh, how do you look at it? What, what about your own family? And A.Q. Khan said, I have not forgotten those days during the partition, when I ran through the Rajasthan desert, hungry, thirsty, and panicky, out, out, to, into Pakistan. If the Pakistan's existence is ever threatened, even if it means killing my own family, I will use the bomb against them. 
I think that's a good point to <laughs> end this presentation. May I invite uh, Vazira to make her comments? Um, thank you. Um, as someone who's uh, very understanding of a lot of concepts, uh, modernity, violence, um, have been shaped very much by your writings. Um, you have no idea how uh, honored I am to comment on your presentation. It raises so many questions um, that um, I'm not sure where to begin with, but I'm going to say a few things and then um, I hope we have a broader discussion. You spoke of silence, a huge silence that uh, followed the events of partition in 1947. Silence that shaped you, you didn't write on your own experiences and that of your generation and that it's taken a generation and a half to finally uh, begin to write about it. And yet, as someone who is that ge almost a generation and a half away from partition itself, it, despite the silences, permeated every um, childhood memory of mine um, and of the communities that I grew up in. Um, so, this sense that although scholars had not written about partition, um, the experience, memories, the specters, um, especially the last ones that you raised, um, very much um, shape us, have shaped us um, in, in profound sorts of ways. And thus, in my own book, I wrote um, that partition is not an event that took place in the past. It's not something that happened and that it's over and that's, that, it's, that it's behind us. Even when it seems past, uh, new generations that have a distance of time, um, distance of space, uh, uh, I've heard people uh, say, you know, in, I, I grew up in South India, so far away from North India, the epicenters of this violence, despite the distance of space um, from these epicenters of genocidal violence, um, we still have to reckon with what I think uh, most powerfully is captured by a phrase that Veena Das uses of this violence world annihilating violence, world annihilating violence that we have to reckon with. I know you try to address the softer sides of this violence, the people that helped, the very large numbers of people that helped in the midst of this violence. Um, the remorse, uh, the, the, the remorse, the guilt that shapes those who perpetrated the violence. Yet, that violence um, was world annihilating, world annihilating in that a world, uh, a way of being in the world, a way of making meaning in the world was profoundly ruptured. That capacity for world annihilating violence that capacity for world annihilating violence, and especially this last metaphor of A.Q. AQ Khan building the bomb, um, so that there would not be um, that kind of partition violence again. Or every time that people say in the region, it was like partition, they witness a, 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 a conflict forms of violence and will say it was like partition again. 
they are referring to this capacity for world annihilating violence that is palpably with us. It's palpably with us in, uh, in this region and arguably uh, beyond. So we have to reckon with this violence and make sense of it. In, 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 in I think, ways that might take generations of work, really. When I began working on uh, partition in the late 1990s, it was usual to think of the violence of partition as communal violence, writ large. Communalism and communal violence form the basic categories through which one came to examine or understand the events of 1947. They had structured the debates on why partition had happened and was used to explain what had happened. And what I believe your work and that of Vina Das, Bhaskar Sarkar, and a bunch of uh, uh, people who have been trying to think about this violence philosophically um, in particular suggests that partition violence needs to be considered as a distinct historic and epistemic category, as a distinct historic and epistemic category. And especially as we push it up against conceptions of genocide, we use the word genocide and Holocaust interchangeably, we also need to understand the normative framings of Holocaust, of the Holocaust, um, and, and think against it on the broader canvas of the 20th century as a whole. So the question I would like to ask is, what is it that makes partition violent, violence distinct from both the colonial categories of communalism or communal violence as um, well accounted for in a vast historical literature in the region, as well as what makes it distinct from um, genocidal, genocide studies and, and the normative understanding of the Holocaust as a foundational experience uh, for thinking through um, genocide. One of the texts I've been reading quite closely again uh, recently is Ambikar's 1914 seminal text. Ambikar was a, a Dalit political leader, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with South Asia, um, and um, uh, one of the, the key figures uh, for the making of the Indian Constitution. He wrote a text in 1940 called Pakistan or Partition, a phenomenally extensive study of the debate on partition in 1940. And he presented a really pragmatic and bloodless vision of partition. What you said uh, earlier that um, people at the time could not conceive of partition as violence because that kind of partition simply there had been no historical experience of it. Well, certainly Ambedkar in his text presents a completely bloodless vision of partition and the making of two nation states constituted by the euphemism of the time, transfer of populations, a planned transfer of populations. And he argues basically that a planned transfer of populations uh, would result in a more or less homogeneous Muslim Pakistan um, and would rid India of its minority problem. Yet historical accounts have repeatedly argued that Indian leaders of the time of all spectrum, Muslim, Hindu, Muslim League, Congress, etc., etc., refused to consider or concede to uh, ideas of planned transfer of populations, an idea that was prevalent, circulating, um, discussed in the 1920s, 1930s, so certainly available um, as uh, a category uh, for thinking about nation state formation in the midst of these debates. 
Um, Indian leaders refused to concede to a planned transfer of populations. Um, and it was only after the catastrophic violence in the Punjab in particular began to lead to massive displacements of people that the two na nascent uh, nation states agreed to a limited uh, uh, transfer of populations on the basis of religion. It was limited to the Punjab and to certain regions in the Northwest. Bengal notably was left out of it. And recent work on the Bengal by other uh, historians like Joya Chatterjee and Hemanti Roy have in fact argued that maybe there should have been such an agreement for Bengal, a tr planned transfer of populations. Uh, let's deal with it in an organized fashion. So this recalcitrance of Indian leaders towards in more or less accepted, well, uh, ex to a certain extent available political theory of the time in this respect could not have accounted for the ways in which conceptions of nation, conceptions of nation came to both rupture and cohere to a multi-religious communities that live side by side. Or did they? Were there conceptions of nation that ruptured and cohered to, gave new meaning to these multi-religious communities, uh, is such that one could then begin to think about partition violence, a distinct historic and epistemic category, as one um, in which it gives us a different account of organized violence. Now, organized violence um, uh, uh, is what um, um, industrialized violence is what one particularly considers remarkable about the Holocaust. And um, in, in the Indian subcontinent, the violence has been for a long time uh, uh, understood under the rubric of chaos, madness, um, a rupture organic civic. But is there here a space for thinking about um, of, and beginning to give a different account of organized violence on which conceptions of genocide or ethnic cleansing might rest upon? Can Bachan Singh and Mangatram's accounts help us answer that question? And it's quite striking that the forms of violence that they participate in and they give an account for are organized, are organized. They, they do not revert to, um, in the instance of explaining their actions as a momentary lapse of uh, their mind of, of madness. It's only afterwards, after they've completed their account, that they turn to that trope um, for thinking about uh, or making sense of what they have uh, personally participated in. I'm going to end there because I'm sure I'm out of time because I have a few other things to say, but maybe I can bring it back um, in, in discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Wazira. Um, we are supposed to close this uh, session at 7. Let me suggest that we will have an extra 10 to 15 minutes because we'd like to let me see uh, what kinds of questions emerge. Um, so we can go on till 7.10 if necessary and then there is, I think some of in chat, right? Okay. So let me, uh, let me um, just put one thing on the table. There's a paper in American Political Science Review recently, Ashish mm -hmm. and Wazira by Stephen Wilkinson of Yale and his partner um, at Stanford. And they've been doing a statistical work on violence, partition violence. And they argue that the highest incidence of violence was in areas of decommissioned soldiers. 
that they would like to argue that statistically they can establish that um, that the soldiers who came back uh, and were decommissioned committed the maximum amount of violence. It was not the ordinary citizen who did it. Right? There is a controversy over this. Uh, many uh, scholars uh, and these uh, the, the, the written critiques will emerge later because now they're part of conference discussion at this point, a seminar discussion. Those who study military histories and militaries in general argue that this, uh, that this is deeply conceptually flawed. Hmm? That actually soldiers, even after they're decommissioned, the, the studies of militaries, hmm. soldiers, even after they're decommissioned, do not kill civilians. Right? I wonder, uh, in the next half hour that we have here, whether you would have any remarks to make from a, either a sociological or clinical psychological perspective. But this will become a very big uh, debate very soon. The paper is out only a few months back. This has been presented several times, including here in, 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 in the seminar that I lead. Uh, it's, it's been presented here. So uh, that's just one thing to put on the table. The second thing to put on the table is the study of your fellow psychologist, Sudhir Kakkar, of Hyderabad killers, riots, right? He gives them, as a psychologist, I, in my work I met a lot of killers, they never admitted they were killers, right? So they, you need, I think, the, 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 the skill of a psychologist or, a, um, uh, or, or not a political scientist, a political scientist can't handle this. A psychologist can figure this out much more easily than I can. Uh, given my training. So Sudhir Kakkar writes, uh, he interviewed uh, killers of riots in Hyderabad. I, I think I met some of them in my work in that city. But he managed to, managed to get them to confess that they actually were killers. Hmm? But his, clini his clinical psychological conclusion is that I can't call them killers, I call them warriors. And they describe the, a riot in two terms, either as a war, when if someone has killed 28, you have to kill 29, your side. And these were mostly wrestlers, actually. Mm? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they also call it a cricket match, one day cricket match. If the other side has made 128, you make 129, mm. right? And, and they constantly go back and forth between the analogy of a one day cricket match and war. Mm? And finally, he concludes, so Sudhir Kakkar concludes, I've not assigned this to my undergraduate class, there are lots of students here, but I do assign it to my graduate seminar, that, mm -hmm. that particular chapter. Uh, he concludes that as a clinical psychologist, there is no term I can use after interviewing them except to call them warriors. I can't use the term killers for them. So just two things to put on the table, and let's invite now, now questions and comments from the audience. Bashara, do you want to go to the... It's being live streamed, so so if you go to the yeah. Professor Bashar Dumani, Professor of Middle Eastern History. I wrote my questions down, but it's too embarrassing to read them in front of a microphone, so I'll try to remember. Um, one is a simple methodological question. Uh, the argument is built on testimony of people that you interviewed. But a standard objection in anthropology, at least, is that these interviews can never be trusted. They don't mean anything more than what the people at that time of the interview were thinking about the concepts, the categories that they used. I believe you're familiar with that. So reading verbatim uh, from the testimony to make a point later on about how this affects political culture, uh, there has to be a step there that explains your thinking about the act of telling, remembering, and listening. And I'm wondering if you can say a few words about that. So that's the simple methodological question. The larger issue has to do with interrogating the term violence. So <clears throat> you mentioned the four partitions. Um, uh, my father never told me anything about what happened to him in Haifa in Palestine. Uh, I could never find out anything from him. Uh, I had to find out from other people. And most of the information I find out does not have to do with the particular violent days that took place. Uh, I can think of many other patterns that are exactly similar to what you said, but the situation is very different. There, 
the emphasis was not on killing, the emphasis was not on genocide, the emphasis was on destroying a society as it is composed of a built environment, of social relationships, of economic structures, etc. It was a systematic planned ethnic cleansing transfer of population that was very much in the air, but the focus was not on killing people. And I noticed that much of the discussion has been around the act of killing. And I'm wondering if that is taking us in a direction that is not germane to this epistemic distinct form of partition violence because how else can we explain the same exact patterns in a situation in which killing was not the primary idea uh, and yet we have the same exact things happening in terms of people's memories and forgetfulness and so on <coughs> and so forth. So these are the two quick questions. Thank you. Other thoughts? Perhaps we can have Ashish's uh, responses to, the, to some of the points made here. Uh, I have been studying this kind of rights and violence for something like 45 years. <clears throat> and I would be inclined to agree with Bajira that partition violence was a different kind of violence. The other violences we have seen in India, Hindu-Muslim violence, for instance, riots, have a very clear-cut pattern. Occasionally, something like the Gujarat riots take a different kind of shape. I'm just to, I can give a little bit of figures that will make my position very clear. In India, out of the 30 states, roughly eight states account for all violence. Other states do not have. Many of the other states also have the same kind of mix of population as the riot affected states are. There is that division. Secondly, almost all the riots take place in the cities. I mean, uh, Ashutosh Vashnaya's data will show that something like, if I'm not remember it correctly, 93.6 percent, sorry, 93 point, uh, something 93.4 uh, uh, of the killings take place only in the cities, whereas only about 30 percent of Indians live in cities. And and over the period we are talking about, it was that figure was more like 25 percent. Uh, and of the cities, only 10 cities account for most of the killings. So it is a very peculiar thing. This is one. The second thing is this, that if you look at these riots data, if you see that, for sex, say, for example, uh, the works of somebody like Asghar Ali Engineer, who has studied a number of them, there are very clearly two, two kinds of riots, and that there are also partition riot is quite unique, with Gujarat riot coming in with some of the same characteristics. Namely, in partition riot, the so society imploded. It was it imploded, and many of the killings were decentralized affairs. Actually, most of the killings were decentralized affairs. Whereas, in the riots which you see, like the riots which Sudhir Kakka studied in Hyderabad, is a very organized affair. And there are chartered accountants' riots. I will give you one story to make this point very sharply. When I was studying the demolition of the mosque in Ajodha, some of the volunteers who had come there told us that there will be a riot now. the ones who can come to demolish the mosque. They were saying there is a riot now. So we, of course, asked them, why do you think there will be a riot? So they said, because Shishadri Sahab, Mr. Shishadri has come. Mr. Shishadri is a BJP leader. Now, Mr. Shishadri is a riot expert. If he comes, there has to be a riot. He comes only for riots. So he is a specialist. He says, from Hyderabad? 
is a right specialist. That's, uh, this overseas of his parliament, his father also was a right specialist. No, his father, overseas. <coughs> he was a right specialist. In the Charminari <coughs> rights were, you know, uh, organized by him. He was a specialist. You can imagine my surprise when I found out that Mr. Sashadri and Mr. Ovesi were great friends. And every fortnight or so, they shared a meal together. The riot expert on one side and the riot expert on the other. Because riots, bitterness is for the hoi polloi, et cetera, and so forth. Not for the Syrian leaders who organized riot, not for the experts. They were professional detachment from it. So they have occasionally meals together. They were good friends of each other. So and this is, this captures the spirit. Of the so, but, and you're also saying that mm. partition violence did what not have this character. That's right. It was That's highly right. decentralized. Mm. It was not organized. Mm. And the society imploded. Mm. And neighbors killed neighbors. Yes. Ne neighbors didn't kill. Neighbors Usually didn't. it were mobs coming from outside. Mobs coming village. from elsewhere? There, yes, of the village. Even there, there was resistance. And you're saying it's the same pattern? No, I, I, this is no. where I think the question is. So in the case of Palestine, for example, uh, one of the communities was not organically intertwined with the other. There were recent immigrants from Europe mm. who have been there in less than a generation, most of them. In fact, the population of Jews in Palestine, European Jews, doubled between 1932 and 35. It was only a few years before the partition. So all this theory about communal violence and So the outcomes are similar, but circumstances are very different between the Palestinian violence yes. and the Indian violence is. Mm. Do we have an answer to that, or this requires a great deal more reflection? No, I mean, I, if I may mm. jump into the conversation here. Um, when um, I propose that partition violence be considered a, a distinct historic and epistemic category, I was thinking about it in terms of the huge amount of writing on violence in South Asia itself and the kind of sort of riot, history of riots and what has been accounted for as, as communal violence, violence between communities that lived together um, and um, have had, you know, have had, have a degree of intimacy. So the comparison really is with Jews in Europe and the Holocaust, right? Um, where uh, you have uh, uh, an understanding of genocide that emerges out of the experience of Holocaust. Um, but what you're pushing up against then is um, then is it appropriate to even call it partition violence, right? Given that there are all these other partitions, not all of which are structured by communities of in communities of intimacy. Comparison, Ireland, I had a similar, you know, a fabric of communities living together in which uh, this kind of violence um, was a part of the dynamic in which partition uh, took place. Um, so this might lead me to suggest that, in fact, what um, either we can think of Palestine as, um, as the most important place to think about partition violence as a, a kind of a historic experience and set of practices that then can be looked at in other places or to think of Palestine as the exception, hmm. right? Which is that it is both partition violence and settler colonial violence, um, um, to, uh, you know, coming together, right? Um, or uh, that it needs to be located um, 
It needs to be either be, be paradigmatic or exceptional. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's a big conversation to have. Um, the, the significant thing about partition violence and locating it is the fact that there is so much intimacy and in which this violence takes place. And in most accounts of ethnic violence, um, there is a state actors uh, and, and uh, structures of the state um, um, at work, as well as conceptions of political community uh, from above that come in that are significant to the forms of violence that take place. But if one can think of the violence on the ground as a different form of organized violence um, that comes out of this intimacy rather than from above, um, it might be um, a different way to think about. Suggest to me uh, a comparative politics uh, scholar um, and a need for a systematic comparative conversation between scholars of Palestinian uh, partition mm. and violence and scholars of South Asian partition and violence. That would be a, a, a great conversation to pursue at the, under the auspices of the Watson Institute and its various regional programs. That kind of conversation suggests that. Uh, because I'm very struck by this thought that and, that, and that uh, Bashara is proposing that outcomes in Palestine and India are similar, in uh, South Asia are similar, but 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 the but the but the, the uh, circumstances are, are remarkably different. May share something, but in a very fundamental sense, the, 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 the circuit of ideas that yeah, shape very, very these partitions is the same too. Mm -hmm. That's what's also really uh, compelling. Um, if you look at Ambedkar's footnotes, he is quoting Zionist scholars of the time uh, in uh, making some of his arguments. So they're, they're reading and thinking through a set of ideas that, that have a shared um, frame. We have one last uh, bit of time left. And perhaps uh, if, if there are no, there is a question, good, yeah. There are two questions. Let's take two questions. Sir, would you go first? Mine is a very quick little question. Yeah. I believe there had been a partition of Bengal in 1905 right. that was very controversial and it visited a great deal of fury. But so far as I know, there talk about the Bini violence and was reversed in 1911. What was the key difference then? Here's a scholar of Bengal, too, who can perhaps uh, answer. Let's, let's, let's collect one more question and then see. Yeah. I think one simple answer is uh, that this is a very instrumental conception of violence in the heads of Sheshadri and Ovesi. Mm -hmm. um, it serves their political purposes. Um, it's very clear to them this is, a, this is a, like a strategic political game. Mm -hmm. It serves a certain purpose and, and that does right. not affect their, their meeting every fortnight or every month. Um, um, and. Uh, and, uh, How do you account for the violence of those who actually carry it out? No, no. That's a the the whatever the whatever the the consequences on the ground, yes. right? For them, it's a very instrumental use, right? It's a very very instrumental use, and I think there is a, a, a lot of accounts can be given which go in that direction. Though it's not always instrumental, but this is certainly an example of a very instrumental conception of violence. Um, Ashish has written about it. I have I have a few things in my book about that. 
So it's not unusual. What you found very unusual is not unusual in discussions of riots and violence. It's not. Surprising as it may seem. How about Bengal? Bengal uh, partition its reversal and any violence around that time? But uh, frankly, there was no violence. First, first of all, uh, I mean, what people do not often mention is this, that most Bengalis were surprised to find out at around that time that Bengal had a majority of Muslims. Hmm. That a majority of Bengalis were Muslims was not known to the Bengalis. Uh, this is not an enumerative society. <laughs> but that was the first time enumeration entered the politics in a big way. Uh, Ambedkar was elected from Bengal. Mm -hmm. Because he was supported by Jogen Mondel, the Dalit leader who became the first uh, um, law minister of Pakistan. And uh, you can say the first, uh, people say Ambedkar is the first Dalit um, law minister gave us the constitution, which is only half the story. First law minister of um, Dalit law minister uh, of South Asia was in Pakistan. Jogan Mandar was Pakistan's law minister <laughs> and took charge, uh, took oath of office one day before Ambedkar did, because their independence came one day earlier, as you know. Uh, so there is that part of the story too. So, but these were. Not, let me put it this way, that, in that at that time, the idea of this nation state was known only in a theoretical way. The first generation of in Indian leaders had very little clue to the meaning of it. They didn't bargain for a population exchange and things like that because I mean, to, if you read some of the interviews, I, I do not read it with the eyes of a uh, sociologist. I read it with the eye of a, uh, you know, I, 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 I read it in a very different way. I, I read it as an outsider. And I'm astonished by some of the uh, things I read. Like, for example, Jinnah was offended when he was going to Dhaka from Karachi, which was the capital of Pakistan then. The, uh, Pilot came and told him that, sir, it is customary for us to take permission from the Indian authorities to when you cross India. That's, that's, so we are taking permission, and it's customary for the uh, to exchange greetings. Would you like to say something? Convey your greetings. To and Jinnah was very offended. He said, I have gone this way uh, dozens of times. Nobody has asked me to t take permission. Why should I take permission? They didn't really know what was the implications of running, having a nation state. And a nation state, the logic of a nation state was this, that it must have a nationality, which upholds the idea of nationalism. But India has no nation. It never had a nation. Uh, it, was, it had communities. It, it was a country of 1,500 languages probably as many as 6,000 communities, roughly. I'm, I'm being very conservative. 70,000 castes, 1,500 languages, and so on and so forth. In such a diverse thing, you cannot have, uh, have a nation. The Hindu nationalist dream of making a nationality out of Hindus has never succeeded. Hindus are trusted enough to have resisted it from then, and they have resisted it till now. We talk over and I told me all the polite way, you know. I think we can go on for much longer, but um, it's time to bring this uh, session to a close. And um, we invite you for the next round of this discussion in, on Friday. And our commentator will also again be from the history department, Omar Bato, who has studied uh, violence of this kind in different theaters, uh, in a different theater of the world. Um, that will be two to four at the Jagowski Forum at the Watson Institute. And uh, please join me in, in thanking Ashish and Vazira, and also join us for the reception.